Welcome to another edition of the In Search SEO Podcast, where we paint the town red with search marketing insights. Big time guest with us this week as the Women in Search series continues with a deep dive into everything Bert with the one, the only, Don Anderson. Clear and understandable details on how the heck Bert actually works. The real story on how Bert's implications will hit SEO and what better contextual conceptualization means for content. That was alliteration for you, an element of poetry. Uh, plus, we look at how the very fabric of the SERP might be changing. I am your host, Morty Oberstein, and I am joined by she who didn't know anybody on the top <laughs> 100 greatest musical artists of all time, Sapir Carabello. Hi, Morty. <laughs> so, we're doing this now. No, no. Okay? No, we're Before, not. We're sitting around before the show started. <laughs> And we're talking about various musical artists, so Tom Petty, <gasps> people like that. And so people's like, I don't know who any of these people are. So I pulled up Rolling Stone's 100 Greatest. It's just not- 100 Greatest <sighs> Musical Artists of All Time. And pretty much the only person that Sapir knew was Madonna. <laughs> That's not true. Okay, you knew the Beatles yeah. and Elvis. <laughs> And no, there were other uh, people. Right, you, uh, the best part. Uh, the Aerosmith. Best part, you knew Aerosmith because they had one <laughs> terrible song in the 90s. You don't really know Aerosmith. Okay. And this is for Andrew. This is Andrew Optimizing. If you're listening, this is for you. <laughs> she confused the police with the village people. To go, the police. They're the ones who dress up like an Indian and the. <laughs> Okay, ridiculous. Eric Clapton, no clue. Metallica, no clue. The Grateful Dead, no clue. This is v- what? You blew my mind. Listen, you blew my freaking mind. It's just not relevant anymore. Okay? Right, you're right. Like, Bob Dylan is not relevant anymore. Neil Young is not relevant anymore. Move on. Lord, okay. Lord help us. We are going to move on because I'm going to lose my mind. Okay. Wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. The police. Still the guy who just like the Indians, right? <laughs> Oh yeah, they also sing YMCA. Yeah. That's what stings. That's what stings. Song. Y-M-C-A. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know that song. Uh, yeah, but you know what? They're not in the top 100 greatest of all time. I don't care. Okay. Do not forget, we put out a new episode of the In Search SEO podcast each and every Tuesday. You can find it on the Rain Granger blog. You can find it on Stitcher, on Spotify, on SoundCloud, and of course, you may and should subscribe on iTunes. Also, do not forget when you want to track rank for SERP specialties, whether it be rank inside the top stories carousel, the video carousel, the app box, the app store, Google for jobs, and so much more, you want Rank Ranger. Bye, bye, and bye. Not such a subtle message there. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, I got to eat. My kids got to eat. Right. Bye, Rank Ranger. Okay. So before we get to Bert, no. and by the way, Andrew Optimize, you also like my Bert impersonation. Please or Ernie don't doing Bert. encourage him. So I'll do it once. No. And then we'll we'll no. leave it alone. Please no. This no. is Ernie <laughs> calling out to Bert. Hey, Bert. Okay. So before we get to Bert, I know last week I said that um, I am, uh, because I'm a cynical SOB, that stands for son of a bitch. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Wow, <laughs> I know you're make. so modern. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Mo- that's like old. My father says it. Oh, that's so be. It's like it's like it's like nineteen. That's like it's like nineteen seventies Brooklyn. <laughs> SOB is modern. Okay. okay, because I'm a cynical SOB. Yeah, I said I would never do a segment on SEO trends in 2020, the top trends in 2020. Right. Okay. But last week I said I'm not going to do that. So not only am I cynical. I mean, am I a cynical SOB? I'm also a liar because I'm going to give you a top trend for 2020. Course, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I've thought about the future of SEO. I pondered it. I was sitting <laughs> on the toilet. Like, oh, Ew! <laughs> Morty. What will be good for SEO in 2020? Um, and it came to me. And it might not come in 2020. It might come in 2021, 2022, 2023. I could keep going. Maybe never. No, it'll come. Okay. That's for sure. Um, it's something a bit <laughs> offbeat, a bit different. Perhaps funky, if you will. Which is why, for the second week in a row, we have a new segment for you. Um, uh, we're calling this one fun. Funky SEO, because here's some funky SEO coming at you. Banging out the funky beats. We want the funk. 
Give up the funk. Please stop. You didn't know they were at the parliament. George Clinton and the parliament were also on the 100 greatest musical artists of all time, according to Rolling Stone. Listen, you have no idea who they no were. No one cares, okay? I care. George Clinton cares. No one cares. Not to be confused with Bill Clinton. Two very different people. <laughs> Thank you, Morty. You're welcome. Now, yeah. With you, I have to be clear. <laughs> Clearly. Okay, so I don't remember where it was, where when it happened, where I w- what I was doing, but someone somewhere was talking about personalization and SEO and yada, 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 yada. And it got me thinking. Oh, no. It got me thinking something very funky indeed. We want the funk. Stop. Give up the funk. <laughs> so here's the thing. Okay, so we all know that Google's very good at understanding intent and showing multiple intents on the SERP. Mm-hmm. But this is going to um, cause a problem for the search engine. Why? So here's the thing. The problem will be Google's multiple intent targeting will get too good, too good, too hot to handle, too hot to, for the SERP to handle. What? How is that a problem? Um, okay. It, it's because it can be hard to show. Let me explain what I mean by that. Okay. Yeah, good. I should probably explain that. Yes. You know, I'm just going to say that. Come it's going to be hard to show and then move on. You'll have to <laughs> decipher my words of wisdom. I'm like some sort of SEO poet. Figure it out. No, I'm not going to I know that. you too well. You just love to talk, so you will explain at some I point. I will explain. So, yeah. I won't I push. I will explain. That was me doing the Grateful Dead, but saying the word explain instead of, yeah, get okay, fine. Okay. I don't care. You don't know who the Grateful Dead are. Holy crap. Know. But you like Cherry Grateful Garcia ice cream. Grateful Dead? That's a Forget cool name. It. What I mean by the SERP not being able to show it what, is that okay? Google it, it will further develop and refine its already a stellar ability to um, break down intent into smaller particles. Now, multiple intents appear in the SERP, and they're going to continue to appear on the SERP. But what I'm saying is, the ability for Google to manifest that awesomeness is going to get harder. There won't be enough room. I'm not sure I'm following. So think about it like this. Okay. You do a search and Google determines that it can show you so many different um, result segmentations. But what can it do now other than show you a few results for each segmentation, for each intent? Or think of like an entity or a concept, which yes, I know an entity is a concept. I understand that. (laughs) There are so many facets to a concept, so many wonderful aspects of a concept for a user to grab onto. But how many of these different aspects can Google show on one SERP? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's too much. You can, you can only touch on each user intent. You can't really fully dive into it. You can't fully cater to one intent. That's a problem. Okay. Okay, so now Google does have a grip on this, by the way. Image search. Type in a query, and you get a carousel of bubble filters at the top of the image SERP. All right. Right? So you search mm-hmm. for a flower, the plant, not the thing you cook with. Thank you, Morty. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, no, we need to clarify that for real. <laughs> How would you know? Flower. I mean, come on. Fl- you, need to cla- you need to disambiguify that. Okay. Did I say that right? I don't know. Um, <laughs> so you search for flower, yeah. and you get all sorts of flower types, roses or sunflowers, and you get a, um, a filter for, um, you want to see bouquets, you want to see red flowers, purple flowers, pink flowers, yellow flowers, white flowers, blue flowers, all, all right. sorts of multicolor flowers, we got all it. flowers, short flowers. Yeah. You get it? Yeah. Carousel of options to refine right. the image SERP. In other words, you can customize the image SERP to your liking. Mm-hmm. And this makes sense. Since there are so many ways to break down a flower. Right. Type, arrangement, color, etc. Mm-hmm. The issue is, as I try to clear my throat without you noticing. <laughs> I noticed. <laughs> the issue is, <laughs> this level of conceptual segmentation is coming and is in many ways here for many, 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 many queries. So I think the type of segmentation that you see on the image SERP is coming to the SERP SERP. Oh. That's my point. That's an interesting. That is interesting. Right? So curious. instead of seeing flower yeah. curl- colors in the filters, you'll see something like site types. Right? So you search for a product. Right. And you'll see a filter for reviews, comparisons, purchase. And you click on the filter and you get all the sites for reviews. Or right. you click on the filter, you get all the sites where you can buy the product. Mm-hmm. Right? This way you can quickly see all the sites that are relevant to you. Right? If you, right? If you want reviews... 
you get something that's very specific to your query. Right. Because now all you get are, are if Google does cater to multiple intents and you'll get a few review sites. But if that's what you really want, you have to do another query. More, you know, more often than not, if the, if the sites that Google's showing you are not enough for you to get a good sense of the product you're looking at. Or, or take a concept, for example, okay? Right, let's say you search for baseball. Why would I search? I for knew baseball? a comment was coming. <laughs> Keep keep it real. Morning. You didn't even know who Joe DiMaggio was in in the in Simon and Garfunkel song Mrs. Robinson. Why Here's to you, know? Joe DiMaggio, and Nation turns. You don't know who Joe DiMaggio is. No. Oh yeah, it's all right. <laughs> Married to Marilyn Monroe. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so let's say you search for baseball. Okay, you in my envisioned world, what the SERP would look right. like. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You would see some sort of filter or, or even a carousel. Right. Imagine a carousel. They had different topics in it, right? Teams, rules, histories, places to play, stadiums, whatever it is. So you can refine exactly what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Google does this in a way with related entities, but it doesn't do this with the actual query itself. So what I'm saying is not actually crazy, and it makes a lot of sense because Google's going to get a better understanding of what you actually mean with things like Bert. Hey, Bert. Did it again. Sorry. Right. No, you're right. Yeah. So it would be Google guiding the user mm -hmm. to what they want, and it helps Google showcase the right results to the user so they don't have to do another search to get what they actually want. And so that may meaning Google's ability to personalize and the ability to show you that personalization on the SERP will match up at some point. Now, that makes ranking a total nightmare, by the way, or tracking oh, ranking sure. right. a total nightmare. Um, but that's another story altogether. You already have this nightmare, I think, with the Discover feed, but that's something different. <laughs> it's all funky. That's what I'm trying to say. It's funky. <sighs> Could you use Gave a different adjective, funk. maybe? Gave up the funk. Oh, oh. God, stop. This is, this is a permanent segment. So every time we do this no. segment, I'm going to sing that Please song. Please, no. Yes. Oh, no. Ah. But you know, by the way, I was also thinking, you know what would actually be really cool? Okay. okay so yeah. let's say you want um, a few different types of sites, right? Let's say you want... Um, you're looking for a product. This is what stands out to me. There's a million ways you can regurgitate this. You're looking for a product. Okay? You want to see reviews, and then you want to buy. Now, what I'm saying is you get a filter to show you all the review sites, and then you have to do another query to buy. Or maybe Google have a button there to, you know, okay, now buy the product, whatever it is. Okay. But imagine like you wanted to cater to two intents at the same time. Right? I want review sites, and then I want to buy it. So maybe it would be cool if you can organize the SERP by site type. Here's all my review sites. I look through all of those. Okay, now I'm done. Now I have all my buy sites, my commerce sites, where I actually buy it underneath it, which is not crazy, by the way, because I saw a patent that Bill um, Slavsky was analyzing where Google can um, can group together, or, or what was the word he used? Cluster. Cluster results according to their entity identity. So let's say, for example, you search for cardinals. All of the results related to the bird Right, are on one part of the page. All of the results related to the football team, the Arizona Cardinals, American football team, not what we call soccer, is on, on another part of the page, right? And and, and all of the results, or all the, the SERP features related to the, ba the baseball team, the St. Louis Cardinals, are on one part of the page. There's Google's chunking them. So that when a user looks at all these different entities, the bird, the football team, the baseball team, it's all it's all chunked together nicely for them, mm -hmm. which makes sense. Yeah. So if Google can chunk entities like that, maybe Google can chunk sites together, all the review sites first, all the product sites first, or give you the ability to set it up that way. You get all the results as you get them now, but there would be some sort of ability to, re to reorganize it according to what you want, which, again, would make ranking or tracking rank funky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. All I'm saying is, I don't know when it's happening, but things like this are going to happen. They have to happen at a certain point for Google to keep up with what it's able to do and able to show the user at the same time. Pivotal moment ahead of us in search for 2020, or maybe 2021, possibly 2022, or 23, 24, 25. Oh, are, are you waiting for a reaction? Because yeah. I was waiting for you to say something. Mm, mm, no, you won't get one from me. Sorry. <laughs> Move You're on. as cold as ice. Cold as ice. Oh, you knew that song. Look at that. <laughs> wow. Okay, we should probably get to Bert. No. Okay. Yeah. Right about now. <laughs> cool your jets. I'm not going to do it. Hey, Bert. Uh, <laughs> we should probably get to Bert right about now and Don Anderson.
So, which makes sense because Bert is related to all this ability for Google to better understand queries. So right. it's all tied together. It flows Amazing. right in. You're, One segment into wow. the next flows right into each other. Wow. I'm so good like that. You are. Amazing pivots every time <laughs> in the Insert SEO podcast. <gasps> okay. All right. So put your thinking caps on. Strap in because it's about to get smart in here with Don Anderson. Cut one. Welcome to another In Search SEO podcast interview session. She's a famed SEO speaker, author, and university lecturer. She just might be the smartest person in the search marketing industry. She is the manager of Birdie. She is Don Anderson. Welcome. Thank you for asking me. Hello, and uh, I'm looking forward to chatting with you and your, and your listeners today. Thanks so much oh. for coming on. So I have to ask yeah. you a, a fun sort of personal question. I see every once in a while you have a dog show up in your Twitter feed. So I'm uh, assuming you're a dog person. Yeah, I am. Yeah, my dog is called Bert. Oh, but seriously? I've got two. I have two. I've got one called Bertie, uh, which is the older Pomeranian. And uh, I've got one called Tedward, who's quite young. So Tedward feels left out frequently because Bertie gets all the... Uh, Attention, so. I, I thought that was a Pomeranian. My my uncle's girlfriend used to have a Pomeranian for the longest they're time. Nice. And yeah, they're amazing dogs. Yeah. Yes, they're really nice. I'm a, I'm a big dog fan. I'm, I don't have one now, but I wish I did. But when I was a kid, I had a lot of them. Um, I, if I could, I would have 10 Pomeranians. Yeah? Yeah, I would. <laughs> <laughs> but I, can't. I can't because I'd never get to ever go on holiday because it costs a fortune to get them looked after. They're beautiful dogs. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. yeah I love okay, so we can talk about dogs for a long time, but let's talk about Bert, not the dog, but the the NLP. Um, so just so that everybody's on the same page, I know it's a complicated sort of topic. Um, fundamentally speaking, if you can, and it's an odd thing to do, um, what is Bert? Uh, so Bert is two things. That's important to know because I see sometimes people get confused between uh, the Bert, which is an academic research paper and natural language processing pre-trained language model, which was open sourced by Google in October 2018. And BERT, the recent Google algorithmic, if you like, announcement stroke update that Google were using it in a part of search results and feature snippets. And obviously we have Microsoft who are also using BERT to announce, but it's not going to be the Google BERT. That's probably likely to be a version of the open source BERT, which then they've developed further. So, so yeah, so anybody can take the open source BERT and do a multitude of things with it because it literally takes the heavy lifting out of uh, training a uh, language model. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so there's two things, and that's important to know. Yeah, it may help Google understand things contextually in uh, queries and content, and obviously potentially things like summarization and so forth. Yeah, I like to make a joke that it helps Google understand the words for, of, and so forth. Yeah, for, for, and for, yeah. Right. The English language, as we know, is very, very uh, ambiguous. It's nearly every other word has multiple meanings, and some words have 600 meanings. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, but it's not that their meanings change, but their use in a, in a language changing. The word run contextually right so you I, know, we, I, yeah it means many 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 things depending on where it is in a sentence and the words that come here and that's what Bert is really about right so it's a funny thing because like I don't think we realize like um, how nuanced language is and how variant the meanings are. Like the, even a, even a synonym has various shades of meaning or various. Um, I remember I used to be a teacher, so we used to have this thing called the uh, synonym thermometer. And yeah. with with various synonyms, there's words that are closer to the to the word you're you're analyzing, and words that are while well, synonyms a little bit further away. And that nuance of meaning, I think, is unappreciated by a lot of people. It really is, and the thing is as well. I think synonyms are probably easier to. Uh, you know, disambiguate than uh, the likes of um, polysemous terms that are words that are that are written those written all sound the same. There's a there's another word kind of come to my head. Homonyms. Is it homonym? Right. Yeah. One of them. One of them literally is the exact same word, but with um, but with different. A, a different meaning. Right. Like. Yeah. It's like so, pair and, and pair. One, yeah, exactly. And the root of the word is, is the same. 
so it's even more confusing. Yeah, there's there's quite large nuance there between the three or four different types of amb ambiguity drive. And again, as you say, we don't really realize what's going on when we just go about our daily business chatting to people. Search engines and machines generally really struggle to disambiguate. Right. So I, I want to get into that heavily in, in a bit, but I still, my, my biggest concern is making sure that everybody's sort of up to, up to, um, up to speed with, um, with BERT because it is a bit complicated. Um, what does BERT stand for? Uh, bi-directional encode uh, representations from transformers. So that sounds something from another planet probably to most people. Um, let's try to break that down maybe. So when you say bi-directional, what does that mean exactly? And why does it make BERT so unique? So um, it means that when analyzing a sentence and the context within a sentence, so say I take a sentence with ten, five or ten words in it, probably ten words, um, to, to truly understand the context of a word in relation to the other words in a sentence, you need to really be able to see the words to the left and to the right of a, of a target word, if you like, in a context window. So it could be, one word in the middle, five to the left, five to the right. Bert actually can see all of the words to the left and to the right in the context of the word in the middle. Or sometimes it's actually the word on the left and ten on the right, whatever. What I'm saying is the target word doesn't need to be specifically in the middle. The point is, all previous language models have used what they call unidirectional training. So the context was only looking at the words that I've gone before in a sentence and not the words that are to come, yeah? Mm -hmm. So half of the sentence. And I mean, obviously, if it was a left-to-right language or a right-to-left language because sometimes people in different countries read sentences right. in opposite directions or whatever, uh, or just generally read, read in opposite directions. And um, so models traditionally I've only had the look left to right or right to left, but never at both sides at the same time. So that's a big, big thing, yeah. Right. Some I... of the models previously, I think there was one called uh, Elmo that looks at the right and then the left and then overlaid both at the end, whereas Bert looks at everything at the same time. By the way, that's how you know that this is based on Sesame Street because there is an Elmo model. Really. Right. You know what? I saw one the other day that's called uh, Big Bird. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. When, when is yeah. Cookie Monster coming out? Oh, I don't know. I'm sure that he'll probably be there. I'm, I'm dying for that. They're my favorite character. There's other, models. there's other models that are, I mean, it's quite a joke, really, because there's other models that are a complete play on the word Bert, right. like Roberta, which is the one from <laughs> Facebook, nice. which is just a, a more robustly trained version of Bert. So, yeah, it's obviously based on Sesame Street. That's and hilarious. He's not in the search industry. We stepped into it accidentally. We just see loads and loads of Sesame Street gifts everywhere. <laughs> right. It's brought new life to the Sesame Street gif. Thank, yeah. Thank God for that. Um, uh, it, so I just jump back to what you're saying. It sounds like almost, again, I'm going to jump back. Um, I probably was a couple of times when I was teaching because we used to do this. We used to call them context clues. So you'd have a, a, a word that a fourth grader wouldn't really know or you wouldn't expect them to know as opposed to having them run to a dictionary. What you'd have them do is read the sentence, read the paragraph that followed, and try to use context to build understanding. And it seems that that's very much how that bi-directional bi aspect of BERT works in, in terms of helping um, understand what's happening via, from the, via the context itself. Exactly. And part of the training process is what they use is uh, this mass, mass language modeling. And the original paper, anyway, probably moved on a little bit since then, since I know that there are some papers that actually have said that you, you don't really need the masking. But the point is with this last mass language modeling, as you said, literally one of the words is blank toe, or percentage of the words are blank toe, and Bert then guesses based on the context of the words around. And as you say, it's very much like that. Let's have a look at everything around it and see if we can understand what word is supposed to be there from possible alternatives. Which is very much how humans go about understanding content. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, when, when we have two sentences, we really only need to look at the context of it to truly kind of have a good guess most of the time. You know, if, we, if we're talking about a bank and we see that there's grass, stream, river, 
from. I've just given a, I've just given a word away. I've got <laughs> grass, green, tree, trees. You know, right. you know it's a river bank. If you talk about currency, money, cash, deposit, you know it's going to be the bank financial. So that's just human common sense, which machines don't traditionally have. And, th and that's super important for Google. Obviously, yeah, definitely so, yeah. yeah. Another big use things like synonyms historically, you know, like na neighborhood words, etc., word embeddings to understand words that live near each other. And it's based, a lot of it's based on the, uh, goes right back to Turkey and linguistics. So you shall know a word by the company it keeps. So, and that's from like 1953, I think, John Burr. Um, yeah, and, and it's one of those things, words in a body of text, generally speaking, live near each other if they are related, you know, right. semantically or, or real relations, you know. It, it, would, it would be odd to write otherwise. I mean, how would you even write that way? It'd be strange. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So um, let's jump letters. T for Transformers, obviously not referring to the 1980s cartoon. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah, uh, so the T, right, okay, so my understanding is that the T from Transformers, that's actually a fundamental key part of the way the bird works. It's based on another paper, and I think the, I always get confused of the name of this. It's either called All You Need Is Attention or Attention Is All You Need. Another paper that came out of Google in 2017, and apparently bird works builds upon this, this attention focus. So basically what it means is, you have, um, you have to say the word river or bank, bank, if you, I'll let's use the example bank. So say you have the word bank and you want to work out whether it's related to a river bank or a financial bank. So what attention does in the transformers element is literally like works through, works out which of the words in the rest of the sentence should have the most importance and weight to provide context to the word river and looks at all of the words in relation to each other at the same time. Yeah. So it kind of kind of just literally just gathers context much more deeply and um, works just works out the weight of importance of the words to the target word, if you like. And then it utilizes like a feed forward almost, deep learning and lots of layers in press. So it kind of focuses attention, if you like, on a word. That makes a lot of sense. That's really interesting. And, and so in other words, it's ascribing weight to the various words so that it knows what to look for or, or knows what words to, to use in order to build contextual understanding. Yeah, exactly. Very interesting. Kind of all of the words at the same time, working through, cycling through all of the other words and working out the ones that matter to the context of a given other word in the sentence, yeah? In, in a given document or on a given page, how, how far does Bert go back looking to understand context? Does it go back a paragraph, two paragraphs, the entire page? Is it constantly looking at the, is it keeping the whole page in mind as it moves from one sentence to the next? Uh, oh, well, I'm not entirely 100% sure, but what I do know is that one of the major points of Bert is that it could not only just guess the next, guess some of the last words in the sentence, but it could predict the next sentence. So presumably that's at least the same the sentence it's in. And the next sentence as well, yeah. That's very so, cool. Um, yeah. So, really but I cool. know that. Well, from reading, there were some weaknesses with the original Bert when it came to the next sentence prediction part, and um, I believe that there's a paper that's not so long ago come out, which is supposed to be Bert's predecessor, which is again from Google and a collaboration with Toyota Research, which is called Albert. <laughs> Not only is Albert more efficient and able to do things less computationally expensively, but also Albert apparently fixed some issues with the original Bert not having not not always getting the next sentence prediction right. He had some flaws. So maybe that's part of the reason why Google's let it run for a year and everybody in the open source community has kind of improved on it, etc. With their various own models, and that continues. Um, and then obviously Albert's just come out, which is much more uh, computationally it's less expensive and you don't need as many parameters. So that sort of brings up to a question I wanted to ask um, eventually anyway is, okay, so you have Bert and it's great, but what, what gaps, do, and, and you know, it's funny because like in the industry, it's always the next greatest thing. Wow, this is amazing. It solves all these problems. But what problems does Bert still present or does it, does it still leave Google with 
that Google can't understand using BERT? Like, what are the limitations? Uh, well, even even in the blog post that came out when it was announcing Google BERT, language is very complex. It's never going to be perfect. And obviously, words context is not necessarily users context. The minute you, the minute you have somebody crossing the road with a mobile or with somebody, you shouldn't be crossing the road with a mobile phone in their hand, but they probably do. But the minute somebody's crossing the road with a mobile phone in their hand, one eye on their phone, one ear on the phone, one ear on the road, and they're in a particular location or they have a series of subtasks and tasks to do, there's still absolutely loads of gaps there, for instance. You know? But also there are many other gaps as well because you know, models like BERT are all, but they're still computationally expensive. So obviously scale is a big issue for search engine. So, so Google's not perfect, no search engine is perfect. The more I uh, research I are, if you like, and go to the conferences and read the books and read the papers and watch the videos, the more I realize that there are still absolutely thousands, if not millions of unanswered questions. You know, context is still a massive issue. Um, the, the mobile experience, if you like, the users and the Almost like the Internet of Things, all the different devices now coming into the mix. That, whilst it solves a lot of problems, it actually adds a lot more as well. <laughs> and also, you know, search engines, machines still don't have common sense at all, you know. And um, every day we still know that there are 15% of queries that are not seen before. Those are like often real world events that have not happened. So, that's the drugs to learn any model. And also we know that Google's only using it in a percentage of language. We know that potentially Bert has this monolinguist and multilinguistic capacity, i.e. it can learn from one language and transfer across some things, but that's not perfect either. You know, so many, so many unsolved problems out there. Lots of gaps. Right. I mean, it's, it makes you makes you think like, the, you know, the idea like, you know, the machines are going to take over and, you know, it's the age of machine learning and AI is scary. Like there's there's an enormous gap that exists. I don't know if it will ever come to a point where a machine can think just like a human can. Yeah, absolutely. And also, whilst we've seen this hockey stick progress in the past year with the likes of Bert, etc. From what I've heard recently, I've been reading about, so quite a bit of it has plateaued off because gets to a point where, you know, there's only so much progress that can be made, if you like, before really it needs another another big innovation. And if we think that BERT is probably the biggest thing over, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, maybe, potentially there's going to need to be other big quantum leap uh, developments as well to expand on that. Because, you know, as I said, people were just building bigger and bigger models and that was the solution to, you know, improve, just train it more, build more models, add more, add more language. And that obviously has its limits. It's not really innovation as such, it's just feeding something with more data and making it more expensive. And there's a lot of, lot of areas in natural language processing that are really, really complex. And, that, and that's what's funny about this. That there's there's always layers to this, and it it's kind of funny to me because like the depth of human understanding, the the quality of human understanding, the, the ineffability of human understanding is so complex and so deep. We don't understand that, and then we're so worried that we're gonna we're gonna complete this AI picture so quickly and so fast when we don't understand our, our own thinking to a certain extent. I find to be yeah. interesting. Uh, you know, it's, yeah, when we look on Twitter, it's very you know you you look on Twitter sometimes you see people misinterpret what somebody else has written. Right. Time, and that's humans. You know, you listen to a, I always use the two Ronnies, which is a famous comedy duo from the 70s and 80s, maybe even the 60s in the UK. When I was growing up, I absolutely loved them. <laughs> Very famous. And a lot of their sketches were about human misunderstanding of language, like the four candles and four candles thing. You know, that sounds exactly the same. Right. <laughs> four candles and four candles. You know, that's a classic example of, very difficult for search engines to disambiguate. Obviously, they understand the intent because when they look at searches, drive the intent. Search demand drives, drives the intent there. Even when you t t type in four handles and you mean handles the forks, it's clearly an informational query because 
All the results of two runnings, famous get. Yeah. Even eBay can't rank for four handles. Yeah. Yep. I mean, we it's get. Yeah. So, so a lot of the time, humans are driving the demand. Search queries drive the demand. You know, there's also another classic example that um, I kind of refer to it as in the local SEO space, the local search space. In the UK, for example, there's a lot of places, villages, that have the same names as each other, but they're in different counties. That's quite difficult because if... Sorry, my dog just <laughs> that's, that's okay. So, so the point is that there are other cues apart from the language that are needed, if you like. So I'm going to talk about Manchester in the UK, I'm going to talk about Manchester in the US, I'm going to talk about Manchester in Canada or in, in Australia. Most English-speaking countries of a Manchester, Cardiff by the sea, which is where Bill Slowski lives, but we have Cardiff, and everywhere around apparently in Cardiff by the sea is named after Welsh towns, from what Bill was telling me. So these are all issues that need to be disambiguated. I, I don't think you're ever going to reach that point. Like I, I just saw an article, it was... um. You know, Walmart's coming to Israel because they saw that Walmart was looking for workers in Jerusalem. They didn't mean Jerusalem, Jerusalem. They meant like Jerusalem, Alabama. So like exactly. the, the and, there, and and that wasn't like a tweet or a te- that was a, it, it was just a miscommunication. It was like a one off. Like people just didn't understand it, and rumors started like broken telephone, and then that's just how it goes. We can exactly. And it, that's it's just what it is. Running. I'll give you another one example. Go for it. So in the UK, in the UK. The country split from into towns and then not so much now but it was split up into counties what they call you know counties mm-hmm. and uh, a lot of those borders on those counties changed if you like several years ago now if you have a look on wikipedia at somewhere like uh, croydon c-r-o-y-d-o-n okay. you'll see it has a metropolitan borough of this county of that ceremonial county of this historical county of that when you ask Google what county is Croydon in, it actually comes up with the wrong answer. Okay. You can't understand the difference between historical county, right, right, ceremonial county, metropolitan third county, and what else keeps it alive, in my understanding, is humans. Because what happened is older people that grew up in a time where Croydon was in Surrey, yeah. Type in Croydon Surrey, Croydon Surrey, and re- reinforcing Croydon Surrey, yeah. Right. Whereas actually Croydon in Greater London, yeah. But people type in Croydon Surrey and then they click that result and so forth. You know, so just reinforcement that this is the way it should be. That's but really interesting. That's a good example. Yeah. Exactly. So that's a good example. And then also what happens is this people build websites then with the wrong parameters in their locations. Because they're copying. Google. Oh, interesting. Think, that's yeah. that's funny almost. And then that splits it down further, reduces the probability of it being right. You know, so we add to that as webmasters. It's an endless cycle. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I don't want to get sucked down this wormhole. Too. We can go down this forever. Um, <laughs> let's talk about a little bit like, um, so there's been this idea of optimizing for BERT, which is obviously sort of insane. But leaving that aside for a second, is there, a, is there anything to trying to make sure that your content, that the way you speak, the terms you use, how you speak in any given web page is consistent and uniform so that you don't create a sort of um, discord between the terminology so that Bert mm-hmm. makes sure that it understands what it's understanding correctly? Or does it not really matter? Uh, I thought, well, I'm not, I'm not so sure whether this would actually be Bert, but I think there's other, there's other algorithms of Obviously, there's loads of algorithms at play, but I think there's, I think there's other areas where actually you can't optimize for birth and you right. can't optimize for things like disambiguation further. So, for instance, you know, if you've got a project that has very, very similar categories and a lot of the same products in each of the categories and they mean the same thing effectively, or potentially our categories that could be, you know, semantic, similar synonyms of each other. You know, I noticed recently on a project that one of the one of the categories pages would be an index, and the other one wasn't, and that was because synonymous, synonymous, synonymously, one was being seen as a, almost the same as the other. So merge these sorts of things, you know. So yeah, and then just 
just add to think about the word. I think there's a lot of people in maths in out there that don't actually take it back down to the basics of these are words. This is a machine trying to understand words. And I think the ones that are not really focused on SEO, maybe SEOs go too far the other way, but in general marketing, those that are not focused on SEO, I think expect search engines and think the search engines are cleverer than they are. Right. And they're not. So, you know, <laughs> these are still just words. There is a limit. We have to like, we have to assist if we can through the site structure, use of things like inheritance from categories and subcategories, and things like gazetteers, which is a big deal. Gazetteers are lists, lists that add context, you know, uh, subcategory lists and so forth. So watch out for disambiguation across categories that may actually emulate each other too much because you're going to weaken your website. Those are the sorts of things that actually I see that having some kind of impact on. That's really interesting. It makes a lot of sense. The disambiguation this, this, this aspect makes a lot of sense. I never really thought about that. Yeah. I'm running an experiment on something at the minute where, and I'll let you know how it go on, where I literally have like thought, yeah, that category is the same as that. I'm just going to delete one and redirect everything to the other one. No, that's a, so, definitely let me know. That's amazing. We'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll it, see what happens. It's really interesting to see. Like, you're really, like, it, Google said it's the biggest change in, in what, five years or something like that? Uh, probably the biggest actual improvement in search ever. Right. And, and and there's so little that's known about it from a strategic point of view or how to approach or not approach it other than let's optimize for BERT, which is obviously uh, ridiculous. Just, just optimize for an imperfect search engine in humans. If they <laughs> categories, strong categories, strong you know, ontology, strong taxonomies. Often the biggest clues come from the ta- not taxonomies and subcategories and categories within a site. Just build a good skeleton and then fill it with strong flesh, which is your content. So this brings us to my, my, my last question to you. And it's, a, it's part of a fun little bit that I do. It's called Optimize It or, or Disavow It. And yeah, for those of you who listen to the show regularly, you know it's where I give you two options that are either really good and you're stuck choosing between a really good option um, and another really good option, or where I give you two really bad options and you're stuck between, choosing between two terrible options and that's terrible, of course. So this okay. would be the Don Anderson version of Optimize It uh, or Disavow It. I'm going to ask you pretty much what it, the most absurd, ridiculous question that really is exactly what you're just mentioning before. If you had to optimize for either one of these two things, either rank brain or Bert, and I, and I realize that that makes absolutely no sense, but if you if you had to, your life depended on it, and you had to give an answer, which would you optimize for, Bert or rank brain? Can I say neither? <laughs> That's not an option. That's not fair. <laughs> You can't yeah, do well, that. The thing is, you, yeah, the thing is, you can't optimize for either. That's that's like saying, um, oh, I don't know, can I fly to the moon without any kind of uh, rocket or anything? Right, it doesn't <laughs> exist. I get it. Okay. But it doesn't, I think there's better things to do with your time. Like, <laughs> such a site well, you build, you build a great, so a strong taxonomical system and, um, you know, just fill it with great and interesting content that doesn't uh, cannibalize itself. Yeah. You, you might spend you might better spend your time trying to find life on Mars, basically. Yeah, I'll do great. Just I know it's a real cliche, but actually build well structured, valuable content that actually meets many queries. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, you heard it here first. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, th- man, yeah. What's that? It's gonna say. Work where the demand is. Right. Search engine work where the impact is. So SEO should do the same. Think about <laughs> impact. Think about what we only have so much time. Think about where best to spend that time. Yeah. Right. And don't optimize or try to optimize for something you can't optimize for. Probably bad things you can do with your time. Like, right. Because that doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Looking for and <laughs> think about the best ways you can provide that. Well, Don, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. It was a really enlightening, really deep conversation, probably one of the deepest conversations I've had on this podcast, so I thank you for that. And um, let me know how that that study goes with the uh, with Bert. Yeah, I will do, yeah, yeah. I will. I'll, uh, I'll let you know. I've had a few fail tests in the past, though, so it might not do what I wanted to do. So. Huh. <laughs>
<laughs> Some, yeah, that's the thing. At least it's looking fast. Either way, it sounds awesome. Yeah. Thank okay. you so much. That's great. Thank you again. Bye bye. And we are back to your regularly scheduled in search SEO podcast. When you deal with Bert on that level, she's a, she's a genius, by the way. Mm-hmm. Like she, I think for fun, listens to like academic talks on NLP. Things that would make you like, what? So when you get, you're looking at me like, stop looking at me like that. What do you want from me? <laughs> Just nothing. Okay. I want nothing from you. <laughs> Except to know who Bob freaking Dylan is. Anyway. Uh. There's so much once you leave the cliches of Bert behind that you can actually get into that thing that people miss. And that was actually very enjoyable for me and enlightening for me and fun for me. That's good to hear. Because I'm a geek and I find that thing fun. That kind of thing fun. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Do your thing. And now. Now. As brought to you by Sapir, it's the news. So Sapir, do you please hit it with the news? <laughs> Google bugs again. The URL parameter tool in Search Console is having an issue showing accurate data, while crawl stats report is lagging with old data. Right. I think these might. Um, I think I saw somewhere that one of these got an update and was fixed, or maybe be fixed. Might have been fixed. It's hard to keep track. Okay. Let's There's so many on. bugs. Let's move on. Okay. Reports are abound that Google is very slow these days with their reconsideration requests. Good to know. That's what happens when things go <laughs> manual when you don't automate things. Things get slow. Right. The EU is forcing Google to list DuckDuckGo as a default search engine on Android. Big moment for DuckDuckGo. <laughs> You've Duck really Duck made Go. it. You've made the prime time, DuckDuckGo. <laughs> You're here. It's on. DuckDuckGo, welcome to the real world. <laughs> no, for real. I... Duck, duck, go. I don't know. Maybe you know, SEO prediction. SEO prediction 2020. Okay. By 2030, we'll all have forgotten Google and we'll all be using <laughs> Duck, duck, go. Oh. Chew on that. Savage. Okay. That's a sound bite right there. Mm-hmm. That's not true. But Duck, duck, go is, you know, they're, they're building themselves up a little bit here, huh? Yeah, yeah, sure. They are. Right. It's good. Go, go, duck, duck, go. Sure. But is is it go duck duck go or go duck duck go go duck duck go? Can I move on? Yeah. Okay. It's an important question. Lastly, there are some reports showing that Google may have dropped support for table schema. You know what else dropped? What? My respect for you because you didn't know half the people on the hundred greatest musical Can arts you of all time. Move on. Okay. <laughs> listen, I listen to com- contemporary music. Okay, not old. Music. So Google uh, in 2018 came out with this um, support for table markup where you can show tabular tabular da- data in a in carousel form, if I'm getting this right. Reports are coming out that the results that used to show that, which were few and far between to begin with, are no longer producing that. John Mugler was asked about this, and John said, we're making changes all of the time. So that was specifically helpful. Um, so it could be it's gone. Mm-hmm. It could be it's not. You mm-hmm. probably didn't use it anyway. <laughs> All right. Oh, are we done? Yes. Oh, that's hey, it. How am I supposed to know that? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sapir. My respect <laughs> for you did not diminish. At all. <gasps> I never respect you to begin with. Oh. Uh, oh. Okay, it's on. And with that, we with have that? a very special segment for you now called we the Fun it? SEO Send-Off Question. Yeah, fun, fun, fun. Fun, fun, fun. Okay, this wait, week... Wait, you wait, have, wait, wait. You always just jump into it. <laughs> With this week, you it's have not to, my question. You have to let the, the listener transition. I'm not transition. as good as it as you. I'm Evidently sorry. Not. Evidently not. We all can't be good at pivoting. <laughs> right. From segment to segment. How about you know, you tease a little bit? We have At least great... you're good at something, Morty. You know? You've been talking to my mother again. <laughs> Good for nothing, poisoning the family, get out of the house, fine, I'm not coming back. Literal conversation with my mother, by the way, when I was 17. That was a literal conversation. And now, thank you for the news again. Um, This is not a new segment, but it's one of my personal favorites. You hate it. I hate it. It's called (laughs) the fun SEO send-off question. Cha-cha-ching! 
Okay, this week I have no. to mention. Wait, what? I have to mention. Okay. It's not my question, and you can tell because it's lazy, l- lousy AF. Okay. <laughs> lousy AF. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's you just say, that, just say it. Just say the word. I cannot. Say the word. Come on. You're an educational podcast. Rhymes with duck and puck, but with an F. <laughs> Give PG-13. One day my kids might listen to this, so I won't. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, so we have a great, fun SEO send-off question for you today. Not written by Sapir. Great. Right. Um, I thought it was good. Do you want to not... ask him? I want to tease it. We're, I want to tease it There's a little bit. There's nothing to tease. You have to build this up. But <laughs> people will get it's, disappointed. It's, it's one of, <laughs> I think, the most interesting questions we've asked. Hang on to your seats here. It's coming at you in five and four. All right, let's do it now. That's, I should, I should that's ask the way, you. yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm not saying this. <laughs> what did, what did, what did Google think? Of the last Star Wars movie, The Rise of Skywalker. What an awful question. Just... But the answer is amazing. I don't have an answer. Because Google... I didn't watch it. Because it's duplicate content. That's what Google thought. Duplicate content. By the way, I didn't watch it either. I didn't watch The Last Jedi either. Why did you ask it then? Because I, so I can, A, give that answer of duplicate content because it repe- it's the same old thing with Star Wars. They even brought an old villain back. They brought the Emperor back. It's nothing original here. Move on. I know there are Star Wars fans freaking out at me right now. This stuff is crap. <laughs> the Force Awakens was crap. The soon, as soon as I found out they killed Luke Skywalker in The Last Jedi, I'm like, I am done with this. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Done. Okay. <laughs> total crap the whole thing was about freaking Luke Skywalker and you kill the character off there's nothing here to watch anymore I will not watch another Star Wars movie <sighs> ever again thank you for sharing I'm done with that duplicate content okay best question we ever asked on lousy the question podcast. awful question the not most as, boring question not as lousy ever. as confusing the village people with the police <laughs> and that'll do it for us to the In Search SEO podcast don't forget tune in again next Tuesday for a new episode Thank you very much for listening. We do appreciate it. It's been in search because we're all in search of Of something. something. Bye-bye now.